Hi there, and welcome to The Artist's Craft. I'm your host, Stacey Cochran, and we have an outstanding guest with us in studio today. Carl Hyacin has been writing about Florida since his father gave him a typewriter at age six. Nowadays, Hyacin writes a column for the Miami Herald and is the author of many best-selling novels, including Sick Puppy and Nature Girl. Hoot, Hyacin's first novel for young readers, was the recipient of numerous awards, including the prestigious Newbery Honor. And Flush, his second book for kids, spent more than a year on the New York Times bestseller list. Thank you very much for joining us here in Raleigh. It's great to be here. Welcome to our town. So the new book is Scat. I have a copy of here. Uh, who do you see as your primary audience for Scat? Well, I mean, if you, if you uh, listen to the bestseller, various bestseller list, it's always like the 8 to 12 age group. And I, I, I don't, I, I sort of have a middle school in my mind, but I've gotten letters from kids as young as 6 and 7 and as old as uh, 75. So it just depends on, on who's interested in it, I guess. I guess when you sit down to write, you don't, you don't really think of who it is. In this case, you, I, the, the heroes of the, of the novel are sort of middle, middle school kids, so I assume that's who will be drawn to it more. Now, when you're out on tour for these, uh, for this book, for Hoot and Flush and now for Scat, um, what's the demographic that shows up at the stores? It varies. I mean, a lot of kids show up, and uh, so we do a lot of question and answers, and uh, they usually have a very sharp question. They're very funny. And a lot of them come with their parents or, their, or the parents that brought them. And then there's a lot of grown-ups who just show up, I guess fans of the other novels as well that are, that are curious and, and will often buy the, the books for kids. They're, they're very loyal, and uh, I'm happy to see them too. But it's a, it's a mix. So there's a lot of crossover with the books that it sounds like. There appears to be, and of course I want them to be very distinct because the, the, the grown-up novels are, are for grown-ups. And so uh, they all have two-word titles, and the, the novels for the kids all have one-word title. And, and in, those, in the blurbs and all the publicity for those young, young novels, uh, I, don't, I don't mention or dwell on the, the other stuff. Because I think at a certain age when the, when the kids are in their middle teens where they certainly can handle anything else that I'm writing. But I feel an eight- or nine-year-old, I'd rather, I'd rather not, not have them reading strip tease just yet in their development. I mean, well, that'd be a good thing. That makes perfect yeah. sense. Well, how is writing for uh, a younger reader, how is that different? Is it any different when you sit down to a computer or? Well, it's all storytelling. So in that sense, that's the muscle that you, that you have to develop and use over and over again. But certainly, uh, in my case, the trick is, is, is to sort of, uh, you know, dial, dial myself back uh, more than a few years and, and back when I was an adolescent, the way I looked at the world. And back then, I mean, even then I was sort of writing little stories and poems or anything. But I had I look at the world pretty much the same way now as I did then. It's just a question of, of writing for that audience. And, and, uh, but the, the attitude and, and the sort of the narrative uh, the tone of some of the satire and the humor is all uh, in these books as well because that's really the only voice I can write in. Uh, obviously, there aren't going to be adult situations and the language is going to be uh, cleaned up, but the truth is that most 10, 11, 12 year olds wouldn't, wouldn't find themselves in the same situations as the adult characters in the other novels. So it's not a stretch. It's not like I have to, I have to rein myself in or, or have my mom look over my shoulder while I'm reading it. Well, you've written a few of these now. This is the third uh, yeah. book for, you know, for middle grade right. readers. Uh, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm curious, do you have a preference now? Are, are you, are, is one more enjoyable to write? Do you feel more satisfied by the end of writing a, a middle grades novel? Or I think it's, it's always the same. When you finish a novel, you, you do have a love-hate relationship. You've, been, you've lived with those characters for so long, and you've rewritten, you know, you've probably looked at each chapter 40 or 50 times, tinkered with it, rewrote, rewritten it in some cases. So there's always the relief of being done. And then the next phase of it is months later when the book arrives from the publisher and you open it up, and how do you feel about it? And I feel good about both of them. I think in the case of the, of the, the novels that I've been writing longest, the, the, the novels for grown-ups, um, it, it's certainly a writing exercise, a little bit different because the plots tend to be a little more complicated. There's a lot more backstory. The characters are more complicated because you, when you, a guy walks on stage in a grown-up novel and he's had five divorces, you, you pretty much have to spend some time explaining how he got to that point. But these kids sort of hit the ground running, and that for me is fun. It's kind of a libera liberating way to write. I, I, I don't have to worry about as many of the disturbing characters that appear in some of the other books. So is it a little, a little bit easier? 
to write. It's not easier, no. And I, and I, and I think a lot of uh, you know, novelists who have tried their hand at writing for mm -hmm. kids uh, discovered the hard way that it isn't easy. They're, they're a demanding audience. They're sharp. They're a funny audience. They get the jokes right away. Uh, uh, they're perceptive and, and, and they're, they're candid in that wonderful way that kids can be uh, with their criticism when they have criticism. So I wouldn't say it's easier. It's just it's a different kind of writing. And I enjoy it tremendously in, in the feedback that you get from writing for, for young readers is, um, you, you know, buckets and buckets of mail. Uh, that, uh, and you just sit there and you read it, and it's, a lot of it's amazing and it's wonderful and it's, it's touching and it makes you want to, it really makes you want to keep writing for that, for that audience because it's such a, a fresh and they've got such a, a terrifically pure way and they've, got a, and they've also got a real sense of clarity mm -hmm. about what's right and wrong in the world and some, somewhere along the way, grown-ups sometimes lose that. Sometimes they come out with that uh, MBA in their hand and, and things that seem very clear when they were young are a little fuzzier now. Ethical issues, moral many, many issues, layers, many, many, many layers, layers. Of, of complications where a kid is just looking at something and it's either right or it's wrong and they're usually on the money with that. Mm. Very good. Well, if you're just tuning in, you're watching The Artist Craft. I'm your host, Stacey Cochran, and we are absolutely honored and tickled uh, paint to have Carl Hyacinth with us in studio. He is the author of Scat, as well as many other New York Times best-selling novels, and we've been talking a little bit about the difference between uh, writing for, for younger readers and, and writing for more of an adult audience. Uh, when you first decided to, to write a, a young adult novel to actually publish, uh, how did your agent and how did your publisher feel about that? Well, it, it wasn't my idea, believe me. I w it never occurred to me to even try. I was approached by an editor at a, at a competing publishing house and I laughed the whole thing off because I, I thought, no, you don't, want, you don't want to expose the youth of America to the way I think. Um, and then my agent and, and my own editor at Knopf started talking to me about it and said, look, this is a natural thing, especially a connection with nature. I mean, you know, I grew up in South Florida, really just just bumming around the Everglades, exploring all these neat places, many of which are gone today, sadly. But that was my childhood, and and I, and I and it for me, the idea of being able to put that experience into print and letting maybe some other kids uh, get the same kind of kick out of it that I did um, was appealing. So. I, I took a chance, and also I had a lot of kids, and my stepson was young at the time. He was 11, and, and my nieces and nephews were young, and, and they were all clamoring to, to read my books, and I thought, I better write something that, that I, I feel comfortable giving them, and, and that's where Hoot came from. That's a great story. So how, do they, how, do they feel, how does the family feel about the book? The kids books? are obviously all older now, and they're, mm -hmm. they, they've read some of the other novels, and they seem to, they seem to be completely cool with it. And uh, the, uh, the best story is, you know, I was so protective. I said, look, at, you know, the characters in my other books, they've, they've got lots of problems. They're grown. I'm writing about corrupt politicians. I'm writing about all kinds of characters. And some of them use bad language every now and then. And, and, and so when my stepson was finally old enough, and is, you know, 15, 16, whenever he read one of the other novels, he just at me, he laughed in my face. He said, and you were worried about this? He said, you, you need to ride the school bus with me one day. <laughs> so I had obviously uh, had my own view of what he knew and didn't know. And I think lots of parents feel that way. You know, they just, it's stuff they'd rather not know. But I still, I like the idea of a younger audience. It's great to be sitting in a bookstore and having an eight or nine year old with a stack of your books and they've practically memorized every word of them and, uh, and ask you these terrific questions. It's just, it's just a thrill. I mean, I recommend it to other writers, because especially after years and years in the newspaper business where you get a little bit jaded and a little bit cynical, uh, to sit in this crowd of very enthusiastic kids and, and think to yourself, you know, they're very smart and they're going to be running the whole show in a couple of years. They're going to be in charge of everything. And it does give you actual hope, which is an unusual thing to carry around these days if you're a writer. That's great. You're an optimist. Y well, I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's still a good feeling. Very cool. Well, let's talk a little bit about some of the environmental themes that run through your books. Mm -hmm. um, of course, there's definitely an underlying environmental theme to, to SCAT. Uh, when did you first become aware, Carl, uh, of environmental issues in such a way that you said, I want to do something about these? When I was very, very young, because Florida at that time, especially where I was growing up, was just disappearing before my eyes. I mean, you know, the, all the little wilderness spots and little ponds in the creeks that me, me and my, my buddies, you know, mm -hmm. um, we hung out at, the, they were, you'd wake up one morning and you'd, you know, or one Saturday and you'd ride your bike out there and 
and you look and there would be it would be flattened every tree would be gone townhomes you, know, you know all the survey stakes would be in so uh, I mean I, I was angry at a young age about it. I said this isn't right aren't they gonna save anything that I'll be able to show my own kids and my own grandkids and so yeah I was pretty staunchly uh, I mean, I was aware of it. I wasn't poli as politically sophisticated as kids are today. I didn't know why it was happening. I just knew that it was just like it's every every day something new was gone. And in the case of Scat, I, I, I you know, when we were kids, we, we were told that this this creature called the Florida panther, this magnificent big animal, which is related to the cougars and the mountain lions about west, there were only about 20 of them left. We were told in, in all of the Everglades, and they were going to be gone by the time we were grown up. So don't even worry about it, and you'll never see one. But I mean, on all our little foray, forays and camping trips and everything, we were always like, I wonder if there's a panther, and we're looking for the tracks, and you know how kids are, you have this vivid imagination. We never laid eyes on one, at least when I was a kid, I didn't. But it was like there was this great beast that was sort of clinging on, uh, this far from extinction, uh, that was out there watching us somewhere. And so I wanted to recapture a little of that feeling mm -hmm. in SCAD about what it was like to be in a place like the Big Cypress Swamp, where it's larger than life and, and, and you just don't know what's watching you. You know, it's, it's when you're a kid, you're not, first of all, you're not really afraid of anything. You're just, you know, I'm gonna walk out here. You know. Invincible. Uh, invincible and you think you're, you're share, you're literally in the frame of mind that you're sharing the planet with all these great animals and, and it's just something you wanna see. So there, and there is a mythical quality to that particular critter. So I, you know, I, I try to take those pages and moments Mm -hmm. from my own childhood because you the old the old axiom that you should write about what you know I think is true at least in my case and I've lived in Florida my whole life I couldn't uh, I couldn't write about Alaska or I couldn't write, write about Montana very authoritatively but Florida I know speaking of Montana uh, there's a famous story uh, that folks are probably aware of of your discovering uh, <laughs> Christopher Paolini's well. first book at a, you said it was in Albertson's before. Yeah, in Albertson's morning. grocery store. Tell us the story. Well, there. Chris and, and his dad had a printing press, and uh, and and Chris uh, wrote Aragon uh, at home uh, and did all the artwork for it for himself. Very elaborate, very beautiful artwork. And he would drive around Montana, and he would have on like a, I mean, he had a whole costume on with the gladiator stuff, and he'd, he'd do performances part. And they literally sold the book out of the trunk of his dad's car, and they. Uh, I was in Mizzou uh, Livingston, Montana, and, and we were looking for something for my stepson to read when I think he was 11 or 12 or something, and my wife stumbles on this book called Aragon, and, it, and we asked somebody, and so oh, that's, that's locally, because it didn't have a, a, an imprint, a, pre a publisher Did imprint. it look like a self-published book? Yes, it did, but I mean, it was, it was still nice, but it was clearly not a, a book that came from a New York publishing house, and I looked at it, and, and she started, she, she threw it at Ryan. She said, you're reading this in the car. This looks good. And so he grumbled and he complained as, as kids that age will do. And yet I didn't, we didn't hear from him for hours as we were driving across. I think we're heading over to Missoula. And, uh, and, uh, and I keep looking back and his nose is in the book. And uh, you know, I think he finished it the next day. It was unbelievable. And he said, this is, man, this is better than Harry Potter. And I said, give me the book. Let me look at this. And I looked at it and I saw that it was a local kid. And, mm -hmm. And then I thought there was an interesting story, and I just looked at the writing, and I said, "This." And he was Chris was 16, I think 16, 17 when he wrote that. And it was very sophisticated, very good writing for for anybody that age. So I I spoke to my my editor at the Random House Children's Book, Nancy Cisco, and I said, I, "There's this kid. I think you ought to take a look at this book. He's published him. He and his dad are selling it all around the state. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. It just strikes me as something good." So they got in touch with. Chris and he, and and he was it, we didn't know then it was part of a trilogy that he'd been working on and he got a contract with Random House and he's done famously but I can't I, let me also say that that was a bit of serendipity but the truth is he's he's a talented kid and he would have been discovered, discovered and it would have happened to him eventually I'm sure how has your career as a journalist influenced your fiction writing well a lot because the, the I, all of my novels including including the kids' books, are set in, in contemporary in the here and now. And, and as a journalist, that's sort of your reflex to write about whatever's happening right now. And, and the material that you get living in a place like South Florida is so rich. I mean, it's, it's terrifying <laughs> if you're just visiting. But we're used to this parade of weirdness and bizarre behavior. And you can, every day there's something in the paper that I might clip out or take note of for a novel. I mean, it's a, it's a very fertile area. Uh, for a writer to live in and and especially if you're born and raised and you care about the place and you got a little bit of mm -hmm. passion and anger that goes with it because as I tell people even though the books are funny the the, the kind of humor I write the satirical humor I write uh, 
and, and this is true going back in history, that most, most, that usually comes from sort of a sense of injustice and a little bit of anger and frustration that this place you care about or something you care about isn't the way it should be. And that, that makes the books, I think, have a sharper edge and it also adds the humor. <coughs> It's fascinating. So why why satire? Is it just something that you've you've written for a long time? What what well, what is it about satire? Well, yeah, I like to make people laugh. I mean, I think I've always going back to when I was in school. I was always like the smallest kid in class. So as a defense mechanism, you develop a, a sure. sense of humor at an early age, or you get your butt kicked. And and I found that that if I could make the bullies laugh, they would move on and pester somebody else. But I also liked, and at a very young age, was writing things and showing them to other people and and getting the kind of reaction where they'd read it and they would laugh out loud. And, and I sort of, as a journalist, came of age, and, 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 and when I was in college, Richard Nixon was in the White House, and, and, we, and Watergate was breaking, and you had the war. It was a tremendous amount of material, and I wrote political and, and satirical columns, both at Emory University and the University of Florida, and I, the feedback was amazing. And I thought to myself then that satire is, in many ways, um, a much more effective weapon if you're going to write about something that's wrong in the world. Uh, than, than just getting up on a soapbox and screeching. I mean, that doesn't work, and, and novelists should never try to do that. But if you can write something, satire has a target, and that's the great thing about the kids who, who read these books. They know right away who I'm writing about. They know right away the, the point of view that I'm taking. I don't have to explain it twice. They get it. Mm -hmm. So the characters for your books, would you say they're sort of composites of, of yeah. real life people? Yeah, I very seldom s meet somebody or say something, excuse me, say something, you know, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I'll hear a phrase or I'll, I'll, I'll hear a story or an anecdote, I'll read something in the paper, but I never say I'm going to put that person into a novel because it's really restricting. You, you want your characters to have the freedom and you want them to grow as you write. Mm -hmm. if, if, if you start thinking in terms of, you know, if you were going to put, uh, let's say, the ex-governor of Illinois into a novel, you would be constrained in some way by your image of him, what he looks like, what he talks like. Mm -hmm. Whereas. If you can, you can borrow a little bit of that weirdness and attach it to your own character and let them develop, it's a lot more fun and it gives you a lot more freedom as a writer. And there is a, there's a lot of weirdness and wackiness that runs through your books. Yeah. Where well, does that come from? Real life. I mean, the people who were, who've lived in Florida for any length of time, they really, they look at my novels as documentaries. They don't mm -hmm. see any kind of extreme edge to eat. And then when I travel around as I'm doing now on a book tour, I do have to explain to people that this is right out of the headlines. There, in SCAT, there's a scam that's being perpetrated. There, there's oil drilling going on in this area of the wilderness called the Big Cypress. Really true, they have oil drills out in the middle of this wonderful wilderness area. And for a while, the state of Florida made this brilliant offer that we will buy back the oil leases mm -hmm. to preserve the area. Well, the oil leases weren't being very productive, so you have an opportunity there for people who see money, free money from the government as putting an incredibly high price tag on these oil leases just to save this beautiful area when in fact they weren't ever going to develop them. They weren't getting the oil out of them anyway, but they figure there's somebody in Washington dumb enough to write them a check, they're going to take advantage of it. And that's sort of un the underlying mm -hmm. bad guys in this book, but that's right, out of the, that's right out of the newspaper, right out of the front pages. So humanity is kind of, we're sort of absurd and some of the policies that we live by are absurd and so it's well, absurd. Well, well, grown are and, and that's why the kids dig these books because I mean I've spent my whole life as a journalist in the last 20 odd years writing this column for the Herald really making fun of grown-ups including on occasion my own bosses in the newspaper business so when you write a book that sort of a novel it takes it kids really dig that because they know that many times mm -hmm. they're smarter than their parents sometimes not but sometimes they're a little they're a step or two ahead of us and I am a I have a nine-year-old in the house now who, re who read Scat. He was my first you know, critical reader of Scat, and, and those are the ones that where your heart is really in your throat, because boy, if your own kid doesn't like your book, you're in big trouble. Thank goodness he gave it a thumbs up, but, but the, you know, they're so sharp, and the, the, the things they have to read now, the, the, the literature that's written for kids is so much, uh, so much more advanced than, than it was when, when, you know, when I was that age, you had the Hardy Boys, or you had Tom Swift, stuff like that. But you, you couldn't walk into a library and just have row after row of great novels to read. Hmm. But you do, they do now. It's, it's great. Let's talk a little bit about the business side of, of publishing. Um, and I'd love your perspective on this. What would you say, <clears throat> you've met a lot of writers, mm -hmm. what would you say separates uh, the New York Times best-selling authors, the top, top tier 
of the authors from, from authors who manage to stay published but perhaps are more mid-list authors throughout their career. What, what is the major differences between? Boy, that's a good question because there are, there are many very deserving offer, off, authors and writers I know who haven't made it to that top tier. And then, and, and to be blunt with you, there are writers uh, on any given New York Times list who, who you scratch your head and you say, oh, there's no God. You know, I mean, how could this happen? Um, I, I always tell people when you look at these bestsellers, there's, there's always several books that are true literary gems, that are, are great reads, that are fun, that are worth being there. And then there's some where you just scratch your head and you go, what is that all about? I don't get it. Um, but uh, I can't, there's no formula I can have. There's no magic answer. A lot of it is luck. A lot of it is hard work. A lot of it is tapping in. You know, in my case, they've never been able to find a category to put these books mm -hmm. in. When I was first writing uh, the novels for, for, for Putnam's, they were always end up in the mystery of fiction. And, and there really isn't that much of a mystery uh, in my novels. There, there is a, the mystery is how are the characters going to get out of this? How are they going to sort it out? But they're, they're not whodunits in that classic sense of that genre. So I'm always amused to see them in mystery fiction. But they don't have a category for satire. And they really don't have a category for humor, and uh, fictional humor. It's really not there. Although there's a lot of great people doing it. Chris Moore and other. I mean, there's a lot of people who, who are writing very, very funny books, satirical books. Christopher Buckley. Um, but uh, I don't know the answer because, I, as I said, there's some days you say there, there really is a sense of justice. A really great, great book like The Kite Runner comes out of nowhere mm -hmm. and really didn't have a big first press run. And then all of a sudden, there it is because booksellers talk it up. They fell in love with it. Um, and then you have other books that just because the name is on there that you've seen a hundred times, it goes right to number one. And it may not be an effort that's going to that you'd want to put into a time capsule and, and, and read a hundred years from now. Well, I think that's one of the big things, of course, publishers are always looking for is, is what is going to create word of mouth. What, right. What does it? What, what well, that kind of a lot of it, is, are, a lot of it are, are booksellers, the people who do it for a living, and they'll read a book, and, and uh, whether it's a kid's book or whatever, it has, and they'll just say, you know, this is great. And they'll move that book closer to the cash register, and it'll, they'll move the display mm -hmm. up. I mean, it sounds like a little thing. But the librarians are a wonderful source, especially for children's literature. I mean, they read everything. They, they, they'll, their heart will, you know, will open to a book that, that maybe commercially would not have, would not have caught, found an audience. And so I, what is it? it is a little bit of luck, but it's also a lot of hard work. I mean, I always tell people who raise their hands, and they go, well, how, do I, how, do I, how do you become a writer? I say, oh, it's real easy. You take 400 blank pages, about this much, and you go into that room, and you write a book, and you just come out. And then you've got your book. That's all it is. It's one of the hardest jobs in the world. And you beat yourself up the whole time you're in the room trying to make it better. So, and, I, and people who are hypercritical of, of, of authors, and I always say the same, even bad writing is hard work. I mean, it is. Someone bled and sweat over those pages. And it may not have turned out into what you think is a good read, but they, they had to work hard to get there. It didn't just materialize. And so it's a lot of hard work and a lot of just believing in yourself and keeping your fingers crossed. And uh, I still am, am a believer, even in this economy where the publishers are spending less and less on finding new authors. They really, it's that pool of money has shrunk, but I still believe that the really talented, talented people do get discovered. And, and, and it may take them a little longer, and they will get published. Um, I, I've just seen it happen again and again. I wonder if your perspective on your own writing, you mentioned you know sort of beating yourself oh, yeah. up about a novel and whether it's any good or whether the storyline's going the right way or the characters, you know, interesting enough. Has your perspective on your own writing changed, uh, you know, from tourist season to to now that you've you've had a lot of success, you've had a lot of commercial success? I've, I've been very you feel I've more been secure. As a no, person. you never feel secure. You feel I mean that the trick, is, the, the whole idea is to get better every time and not to jump through the same hoop over and over again. It's why I don't have a recurring detective guy in all 11 of these novels. I've got a few characters that will drift in and out that I'm fond of and I'll bring them back for cameos. But I do like to kind of start with a clean slate. But you're always trying to get better. You're always trying to do something a little different. And it's a tricky thing, when you're, especially when you're trying to be funny and, and keep the narrative pace and, 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 and be dealing with things that are in some way serious at the same time. But your job as a writer is to entertain. I mean, that's what they're paying you to do. Make people turn the pages. That's what you get the most satisfaction from. So you, you're always, I mean, every book that I'm send off, that last, the last draft, it's due tomorrow. We got, you know, they have to practically pry it from my hands because I have the old newspaper 
instinct of, of uh, you can always make something better. It's never as good as it could be, and all the way out the door you're thinking, no, that's the wrong adjective. Oh, no, 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 that's a bad quote. You know, you're, you're just fighting and you finally have to let it go and hope that... And I've had the pleasant experience of going back. Occasionally I get asked to read from one of the older novels like Tourist Season, which is, you know, going back 20, 20 years, 22 years, and you kind of hold your breath and say, oh boy, am I going to be able to take it? And I find things in there that, are, that I actually I'm pretty, pretty pleased with. I mean, there are things I would change in all of them. There, I see a line that says, eh, that didn't work too well. But then I'll see something and I'll say, God, I wish I could write that well today. <laughs> what happened to me? <laughs> Very interesting. Well, you've had a couple of successful uh, major motion pictures made from, from your books. <laughs> yeah. uh, That's a relative term. How I does mean. it feel to, you know, to watch a major motion mm -hmm. picture adapted from something that you created with a computer? It's, not an, it's not an easy thing to watch. I mean, even when they, you have good people trying their best to be faithful to the novel, it's always got to change. The story's always got to be compressed. Certain characters are not going to make it from the page of the book to the big screen, and you have to be brutally prepared to see that happen. And uh, with, with, with strip tease, it, it, was a, it was a little different. I, I, uh, I, was a, I kept a distance from it. Everyone was wonderfully nice to me on the set. But, but I invested a little more in Hoot because um, uh, the audience to me was, I felt a little more protective. Kids are, are so, when they become devoted to a book, any little change is they're going to notice, and they have noticed. And, you know, the book is not exactly like the movie, or vice versa. And uh, so I wanted to be as involved as I could to try to preserve the spirit of that novel and get as m and fight as hardly as hard as they'll let an author fight in these situations uh, to do that. And I was lucky because Jimmy Buffett was the, one of the producers on that. And he's an old friend of mine, and he believed in the book. We, we certainly we fought some battles pretty valiantly, and others we did not uh, prevail. So you come away at the end kind of exhausted, but then you get letters from kids, and they say, you know, they'll say, well, the movie wasn't as good as the book, but sometimes they'll say, I like the movie better. So you never know. I mean, you just, you just hope that some of that survived to get up on screen. Very good. <clears throat> well, I think we're coming down to about our last 30 seconds here. Uh, what, would you, what kind of advice would you give to aspiring writers out there in 30 seconds or less? I mean? always tell all of them, whether they're young or old, what you should be doing more than anything else. First, read everything you get your hands on, and secondly, keep a journal. Every day, write something down, whether it's a paragraph, two paragraphs, even a sentence, to get into the rhythm and the discipline of writing, even on days you don't feel like writing, because that's what writing is. They don't, whether you feel like it or not, it's your job, and it, and it gets that muscle working, and that's what I always tell people, especially young kids. Start keeping a journal. It's all yours. Don't show it to anybody. Very good. Well, for all of us here at The Artist Craft, the, the hard crew, Marnie and Michael working in the back, we'd like to thank you for tuning in. For the staff here at the Raleigh Television Network, thank you very much for, for tuning in. And thank you, Carl Hyacinth, for, for joining it's us great in the studio. Thanks for having me nice here. Nice meeting you. So I highly recommend SCAT, folks. Go out, check it out. Uh, it is on, I think it's going to be on the New York Times bestseller list sometime soon. We'll keep our fingers we'll crossed. So. SCAT, Carl Hyacinth, thank you very much for tuning in.